Fair for your honest sonsy face. Great chief to know the pudden race. I boon them all, you tack your place, pinch, tripe, or therm. Weel, are you worthy o' our grace as long's our arm? The groaning trenchers there you fill, your hurdies like a distant hill. Your pin would help to send a mill in times of need, while through your pores the Jews distill like amber bead. His knife, say rustic labour, Dight, cut you up with ready slight, trenching your gushing entrails bright like ony ditch. And then, oh, what a glorious sight! Warm, reeking, rich. So that was my uh, experience of. <laughs> So I first heard those performed at um, Patrick Brother Lesser Halls and places like that from the age of seven. Maisie Hill did the toast to the haggis back then, and I sat as a wee girl utterly entranced at the idea that poetry could be drama and at the idea that the haggis could have its own poem. I've not met many other bits of food that have had their own poem, but you know, the haggis, the haggis stands alone. And <laughs> in that, and my dad used to do the immortal memory and talk about Burns and his life. And uh, as I grew older, we're just about coming up to Burns Day on the 25th of January. Um, and uh, I've just loved Burns suppers every year of my life, uh, ever, ever since that idea that poetry can be dramatic and that idea that poetry is life, poetry is our life. A bit later on, I got taken off to um, Poetry and Pints Nights at the Highland Institute in Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow. It was more pints than poetry, I might add. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I met people like Liz Lockhead and heard her wonderful poems, a poem like My Little Sister, which contained the lines, she's competent at peaver. And I always thought, who would put competent and peaver in the same poem? Peaver's hopscotch, by the way, for those that, those that don't know. And that poem imagined you going into somebody else's shoes. And I thought, poetry is about going into somebody else's shoes. I was um, adopted um, as a baby and um, brought up in Glasgow, though I was born in Edinburgh. Um, I guess that makes me a bisexual, but in that respect... <laughs> In that respect only. In other respects, I'm a lesbian. And, um, and I, was brought, I was brought up in Glasgow by two really wonderful um, people, John and, and Helen Kay. And I often wonder what my, road, what my life would have been like if I'd taken a different road. And Robert Frost's poem, The Road Less Travelled By, is one of these poems that I think about all the time. Because when you're adopted, you always have at least a couple of roads that you could have gone on. And you have that anyway in life, but um, my mum adopted my brother first, and uh, she only got him by accident, by a chance remark. As she went out the door, she said, by the way, they said they had no babies at all, and she said, by the way, we don't mind what colour the child is. And they said, oh, really? <laughs> in that case, we've got a baby for you. And then two years later, she said she'd, she'd like another baby his colour to keep him company, and that was quite forward thinking. Uh, for the late 1950s. And so two years later, she got a call from the woman from the same adoption agency who said, I've got a woman coming down from the Highlands and the father of the baby's Nigerian. And my mum said, I'll have that baby. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I was actually adopted before I was born. <laughs> Which is quite exciting because I haven't met anyone else who was adopted before they were actually born. You know, I haven't met anybody. It's, um, so it's fantastic. And I actually feel that if I had a family of poetry trees, I would pick those parents out of the orchard of trees to be my parents and to, and to bring, me, bring me up with all the love. Anyway, when I was 16, my English teacher sent me to see Alistair Gray, who's died recently, the wonderful Scottish writer. And he opened the door to me of his flat in Kersland Street in the West End of Glasgow. I guess a 16-year-old girl wouldn't be allowed to go to 
a man's house in her own these days. But anyway, it was quite exciting for me at the time. <laughs> the young lesbian in me found it thrilling. <laughs> and he, he opened the door and he said to me, Well, there's no doubt about it at all in my mind, mind. You are a writer. You are a writer. And uh, that, that, that sentence just rang through my head for, for ages. And I'd taken a long poem that I'd written about a motorbike accident I'd had, which, weirdly enough, the motorbike accident had changed me into being a serious poet in the, in, in the, in the sense that that's what I did with my time. Before that, I was a Scottish schoolgirl championship runner. And then, I know, I know, I'm, I'm quite impressed too, but... Uh, and then I had this poetry accident, um, well, not poetry accident. <laughs> it's quite good, actually, a poetry accident. Maybe it was a poetry accident. But then I had this motorbike accident, and I uh, hit three cars altogether. The first of them was an English teacher at my school. And then I went right over the roof of the third car and landed outside the graveyard in Kirkintillac Road. My mum said, we could have just thrown you over the wall. <laughs> but, um, but that led me... Again, it was one of these roads not taken. That led me to, to writing all the time and to having this empathy and thinking about being in other people's shoes. It kind of gave me a lifelong sympathy as well for people with any kind of mobility problems because I was out of the game for a year and a half. And I discovered that really writing and reading are the same thing. That if you toss a coin up, you get writing on one hand. And if you toss the other up, you get reading so it was, um, it was really strange. I remember in the hospital that, that this time this woman came into the ward and she said to me, oh, you're a leg. I'm an arm. The legs get much more sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was all legs and arms then. A bit later on, I met the wonderful African-American poet Audrey Lorde, and she was really exciting person for me to meet because she said to me, by then I kind of discovered that I was black. I hadn't properly realized, you know, completely. I'd only realized in a negative way by being called names and everything, but I hadn't realized in a positive way. And she said to me, you know, Jackie, you can be black and Scottish. <laughs> you don't have to choose. And it was a very long and. And that was um, fantastic. And I also met the, the wonderful... Um, lifelong friend, Adua, Adua Ando, who's, who's, here, um, who's here today. And both of us had been brought up in similar situations in all kind of white environments. And, and, uh, and so that was an amazing thing to meet all of these different black women. I met Ingrid Pollard, who's also here today and is responsible for a lot of these photographs that you're actually seeing. And then I met the writer and poet Fred Tegar, who wrote Mama Dot and told me all about his writing for his grandmother. And he was a lovely man. And one time we were in a cafe in Lewisham and there was a baby running about and he said, you look broody. And I said, I am. And he said, well, I'll be happy to be the dad, if you like. And so he, he, he became um, my son, Matthew's father, who's here as well. And um, so that, there, we, there we are all um, together. And that was kind of quite an amazing, an amazing thing. My mum took a while to get her head around it because she only just got her head around me being a lesbian. So, <clears throat> so it, was, it, was, it was tricky at first, you know. I said to her, you'll be a grand. She said, I don't want to be a bloody granny. And then as soon as he's born, oh, who's grand's wee boy? <clears throat> I was thinking about how poetry is life. Her poetry is there at every step of your life. You know, poetry isn't something that's separate from my life. Poetry has actually made my life. And when Matthew was four, he said to me, Mummy, why are you always going to poetry? He thought poetry was a place. Oh, I know. He, got, he, he thought you'd get on a bus or a train or a plane and you'd get off at this place called poetry. And, um, and that's what life is like, that poetry is you know, a place that you get off at, like this. It's a place that comes with you. It's a place that you carry with you in your heart. And it's a place that you can have from when you're a wee girl and you're called racist names. You go off to your wee den and you, and you write poetry um, as a kind of form of defense. So for me, poetry is life, but it's also survival. And it also reminds you at the end of life of, of death. 
Um, my first poem I ever wrote, I wrote about adoption, and my mum used to get me to read that poem at parties. We used to have communist party socials in my house. So I'd read this poem. My mammy bought me out a shop. My mammy says I was a lovely baby. My mammy picked me. I was the best. Your mammy had to take you. <laughs> She'd no choice. My mammy said I was a lovely baby. <laughs> My mommy is the best mommy in the world, okay? So I'd read that poem and my mum would go, oh, she's talented, isn't she? <laughs> she's kind of funny. And um, my, my, my dad was also really loved words and, poem, and poems, and he would read poems to me too. And um, I remember he'd sing songs to me as well, and as a wee girl, he'd sing a song called Kuri Doon and, uh, and Kiss My Head to say night-night, Kuri Dun means settle in. And then as he got older, I would be the one kissing his head, his wee papery head, and saying, Kuri Dun, Kuri Dun. And um, a couple of months ago, my dad uh, died. And um, the last time that I visited my dad in hospital, I'd taken him a message from my friend Nick Drake, because we'd all been on this holiday together, Nick, my mum, my dad and I, and we'd gone up to Akeltabui, um, which is the kind of site of Norman McCaig's famous poem, Ascent, where he says, who owns this landscape and does it have anything to do with love? And Nick had sent four lines of this poem to my dad. When I went to visit him for the very last time, he, I told him that this message had come from Nick, and he took off his oxygen mask. He was on no by mouth by then. And he said, Nick's been over generous to me. I only remember two lines of that poem, <laughs> which was kind of beautiful and, um, and made me think that he was completely himself and utterly present to the end. But it also made me think about landscape, about who owns landscape. When I became the macker, um, I was kind of amazed because uh, it was an amazing thing to be a country's national poet, but it was also amazing to go from being a kid that's called all these different names to then uh, representing your country in a way. It made me feel um, that somehow, at last, I belonged. Um, it was a bit of a steep thing, though, to have to become a national poet before you feel like you belong. Uh, but, um, but, you know, not for everybody, I suppose. <clears throat> but... Uh, <laughs> Only one person got that joke. I'm going to give you a prize later. Um, yes, but, but um, it's been a fascinating thing being macker and going about the country and looking at how Scotland is changing. The other day, I was in Uist and I said to the woman that was driving me around the next day, I said to her, I was surprised to see the big lesbian turnout for me last night. And without missing a beat, this woman's in her kind of middle 70s, without missing a beat, she said to me, I, we managed to hang on to our lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> she said, we lose your gay men. And I thought, Scotland's come a long, long way since the days when I was 16 and Anne Kerr said in the art class, Miss, Miss, Jackie's a lazy. <laughs> and the art teacher turned around to me and said, well, are you Jacqueline? Are you a lesbian? And I said, I don't know. I really don't know. And then I wrote several poems about that too and about trying to explore what I was and who I was. And poetry is one of these forms that allows you to con constantly reinvent and re-explore all of the things that happened to you in your life. And it can accompany you in your darkest hours. It can keep you company in all sorts of different ways. I think about my dad now there he is, walking the road, not taken. Continuing to the walk, the road, not taken. And he's still very, very present with me. I imagine him back on the beach at Ak Melvick, And I imagine him reciting Norman McCaig to himself, or Hugh McDermott, or Sorley McLean, or Edwin Morgan, or Liz Lockett, or Robert Burns. These poets have come with us all our life because poetry is life. Thank you very much. <laughs>